We're coming up on the 75th anniversary of the United States dropping an atomic weapon on Hiroshima, Japan, to end the Second World War. And especially this year, more so than previous years, but usually around this time in August, we get the usual leftist lamentations, second guessing of President Harry Truman's decision, self-flagellation, apologies, and concern about what we did, what a terrible thing we did. In this video, I'm gonna to explain to you why, at the time, Harry Truman made the decision to drop the bomb. I'm gonna give you four main reasons. And also, at the, if you stay with me till the end of this video, I'm gonna explain that quotation, which isn't from me, I wasn't even born then. Who said it and the context within which it was said. The first reason is a simple one. Purple Hearts. What does that have to do with dropping an atomic bomb? Everything. A lot's been made by revisionist historians that we really didn't think we'd have that many casualties going into Japan. That's just simply not true. Just in the invasion of Okinawa, a tiny island, which we took on vicious fighting, suffered 12,000 dead and, and almost 50,000 overall casualties. The invasion of Japan, would be an invasion of Kyushu, the southernmost island, followed up by another invasion of Honshu. The expectation was that there would be a million casualties. And they were serious about this, and we know that. There was such a surplus of Purple Hearts at the end of the war, because they were mass producing them, looking forward to the invasion of Japan, that the U.S. military, in awarding Purple Hearts throughout the entire Cold War period and into the 21st century, didn't have to make new Purple Hearts until we got to the second Gulf War, which, which began in 2003. They had to get new ribbons for the Purple Hearts and new class, but the Purple Hearts themselves that we used all through from, from 1945 to about 2005 had been manufactured during World War II for the invasion of Japan. We had this huge surplus of Purple Hearts. So the idea that they weren't expecting large numbers of casualties, which is just nonsense. They were. The next three reasons I want to talk about are all drawn from the MAGIC summaries. Now, let me explain what they were. MAGIC was the American code name for our breaking of the Japanese diplomatic and military codes. They would get this information in, and then, depending on what the president and the others were looking for, they would summarize these in these things called MAGIC summaries, which would be hand-carried from the Pentagon to the White House, and then Harry Truman could read through them. And then they were returned to whoever brought them over, Sometimes they actually they were actually brought over by the chief of staff of the United States Army, General George C. Marshall, and then they'd be taken back to the Pentagon and kept under lock and key. Now, what's interesting about the magic summaries, and this has been declassified since the 1970s, this is no like big secret, is what Truman was looking for. You know, what was in the summaries? What wasn't in the summaries? And if you look at the summaries leading up to the period where we dropped the atomic bomb in August 1945, Truman was focused on three things. And those are the next three things I want to talk about. You know, what was Truman looking for? Why was he looking at these things? One of the things Truman was tracking with the magic summaries was the progress of a German U-boat submarine, U-234, which itself is an isotope of uranium. U-234 left Germany right before the German surrender and went out into the North Atlantic, but it was headed for Japan. And on board weren't a cargo of torpedoes, but cargoes of canisters of uranium. And along with them, several Japanese military officers who were also on the way to Japan. Now, this U-boat was trying to get across the Atlantic at the time when Germany surrendered. They could have kept going to Japan, but we we'll really never know exactly what happened on board. The German crew decided they didn't want to run the gauntlet for the North Atlantic, the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the Pacific to try to get this cargo of uranium to Japan for the Japanese. The war was over. The U-boat force had an 80% death rate. They had suffered horrible casualties, and these guys just wanted to survive. And they also wanted to surrender to the Americans rather than to the British. So they decided to head to the United States rather than heading to Japan. Now, what happened on board with the Japanese officers isn't clear. According to the German reports, the Japanese officers committed uh, seppuku, a ritual suicide, and their bodies were thrown overboard. 
It's entirely conceivable the Germans just killed him and dumped him over to the side. We'll never really know. But in any event, they ran toward the United States. The British had a group trying to run them down. We had a group running them down. And ultimately, the American group caught up with the Germans and took them into Portsmouth, New Hampshire. My uncle, this is how I started thinking about all this stuff. My uncle actually was on one of those ships. And he told me that when they, they brought the submarine in, they weren't allowed to mention anything about it. The submarine was broken down, just totally disassembled. The crew were hurried off someplace else. And the cargo of the submarine, which the rumor was it was uranium, was put on these unmarked trucks and driven off somewhere else. There's actually some evidence it went to the U.S. Uh, atomic program and it was mixed in with other uranium and may actually part of it may have been dropped on Hiroshima in August. We don't really know. And I couldn't really find out. But in any event, Truman was tracking this thing. And there were these daily reports on where was U-234 until they finally caught it. They knew it was heading to Japan. They knew Japanese were on board. They knew, remember we were reading the German codes as well, that it was carrying uranium. So the obvious question was, why did the Japanese want uranium? What were they going to use it for? Truman knew what they were going to use it for. People in the American intelligence hierarchy knew what they were using it for. The Japanese had an atomic program. Now, you don't hear a lot about it. We don't know a lot about it. But they knew that they had one. They knew what was going on. And when we got to Japan, we did find elements of it. There was, there's actually been claims made that the Japanese test fired a device up in northern part of Korea where they had the facilities, the hydroelectric facilities for the power that they needed, just as we needed hydroelectric power for our atomic program, and that they exploded one shortly before the end of the war, but it was too late. There's a lot of dispute about that. But whether they did or they didn't doesn't matter. It, we can debate how far along the Japanese were. Some of their programs were looking toward uranium. Some were looking to uh, heavy water. And there seems to be a bit of confusion among them, the Japanese scientists, what they were up to. But we know they had a program. We know the guy who was, who was leading it. I just flashed his picture up for you. And we found it when we got there. Now, the problem for Truman was they didn't know how far along the Japanese were. Were they very far along or were they at a long way to go? Nobody knew. But if you're Harry Truman, do you want to find out? Do you want to wait? I mean, if we're going to not attack Japan in an invasion, if we're going to surround them and wait a couple of months to see what happens, what if they develop an atomic weapon of their own and drop it on us? Which I don't think for a second they would have hesitated. What would the historians say if Harry Truman did that? He had the U.S. atomic bomb, didn't drop it on Japan, used a blockade to try to put pressure on the, uh, the Japanese because he didn't want to invade. And then they turned around and dropped one on one of our facilities, maybe Guam or Okinawa or someplace, and killed a bunch of Americans. What would the same historians who criticize them for dropping the bomb be doing today? They'd be criticizing for not dropping the bomb. And if you put yourself in Harry Truman's shoes at the time, you don't know, you know the Japanese have an atomic program. You know they want uranium because the Germans are trying to ship it to them. You know they have this program. You don't know how far along they are. Do you want to take any chances? Or do you want to use your bomb that you've got and put an end to it all? Another development Harry Truman was monitoring through the uh, magic summaries was what was going on on the ground in China. Now, the Japanese had been withdrawing in China for quite some time because things had been going bad in the Pacific. They were pulling troops back, some into Manchuria, some they were sending to the Japanese home islands, Kyushu, others had gone to other places. But they weren't just withdrawing in China. As they withdrew, they had this scorched earth policy. Anything that they could carry with them back toward Manchuria and Japan, they were carrying. What they couldn't carry, they destroyed. Bridges, roads dams, facilities, businesses, warehouses, factories, crops, fields, everything the Japanese were destroying. The previous year, that this had caused a famine in China in which millions of people died. And the Americans expected 
if a Japanese, as the Japanese kept withdrawing in China and kept, kept tearing everything down, there'd be an even bigger famine coming in 44, 45, unless the war ended and they, this was stopped. So it's very interesting that Truman's watching what's going on around in China. Remember, Japan is our enemy. They bombed Pearl Harbor. China is our ally and friend whom we'd been supporting for quite some time, even before we were in the war. So it's often said that, you know, Truman dropped the, the bomb on Japan because they were Asians. They were yellow. He's a racist. Americans are racist. But actually what Truman's looking at is the situation on the ground and looking at the possibility of millions of Chinese, who I would argue are Asians too, and are yellow themselves, who would die because of what the Japanese were doing in China. If we left the Japanese there for another year while we surrounded their island waiting for them to surrender, millions of Chinese were going to die. In fact, during the winter of 44-45, something like 2 million people starved to death from famine in Indochina, even though the British were there and the other allies trying to bring food in to help the people, and they still had 2 million die in a famine. The Chinese estimates of the famine in China, China alone were like 10 to 12 million during the war. So Chinese are suffering large numbers of deaths because of what the Japanese are doing. And Truman's watching as step by step, the Japanese withdraw and they are tearing and destroying everything in the area that they were drawn from. And this is going to leave the Chinese helpless, starving. Something else Truman was following in the magic summaries involved message traffic between Japanese diplomats and military hierarchy in uh, neutral Sweden and nu neutral Switzerland back to Japan. We were intercepting these, decoding them, translating them, the whole bit. Now, what had happened was at the end of World War II, Germany surrendered in early May. Japanese diplomats and naval attaches and military attaches had fled to neutral Sweden or neutral Switzerland. In both Stockholm and Bern, Switzerland, Stockholm, Sweden and Bern, Switzerland, they were in contact indirectly through Swedish and Swiss, Swiss uh, diplomats with American intelligence officers. Now, the Americans were telling the Japanese, basically, while we were demanding unconditional surrender, it really wasn't. We didn't see them as evil and threatening as the Germans had been. We weren't going to break up the country like we did Germany. We were going to have a single occupation, just the U.S. And we also more or less said to them, we would like to keep the emperor in charge. Not so much because we loved the guy, but we thought without him, if we demanded the uh, removal of the emperor, the Japanese would never surrender. And if they did, nobody could enforce a surrender. So we needed the emperor to go along the hold the country basically together so it would effectively be able to surrender and get the Japanese forces to lay down their arms. So this was basically the U.S. backing off of a demand for unconditional surrender, not publicly, but privately. And all this is going on about the time of the Potsdam uh, meetings near, near Berlin, also with the testing of the atomic bomb, which works. And Truman has to make this decision. Then he puts out the Potsdam Declaration threatening the Japanese with destruction if they don't surrender. Now, there's these two tracks. There's a diplomatic track and a military track. And we were picking up all the messages. And most historians tend to focus on the diplomacy. The diplomatic track was promising. The Japanese diplomats did seem interested and did seem willing to push the issue to try to get Japan to back down and surrender. The problem was, what Truman's watching is the military track. And the military track, and remember, we're reading messages going to and from Tokyo. We knew that the American message had been sent to Tokyo in an accurate form. But we also knew the response from the military authorities in Tokyo, which was break off talks. Don't talk with the Americans. The interpretation coming out of Tokyo was we were weakening. Because of the heavy casualties we had suffered in Okinawa, we had backed off from unconditional surrender. And they interpreted that as a sign of weakness. 
so that if they could let us land on Kyushu and inflict even more casualties on the Americans, even if they lost the island, they'd get an even better deal. So they saw this as a sign of weakness, and they ordered their military, especially naval attaches, to stop talking with the Americans through their intermediaries. Now, Truman knew this, and this was happening all about the time of Potsdam. So when he issues the Potsdam Declaration, that's part of what goes into it. We've already told them this isn't going to be like the German occupation. We've already told them that the emperor is going to stay in place. And the Japanese take it as a sign of weakness and cut off talks. Now, why didn't they focus more on the diplomatic officials in these unofficial talks than the military? A simple reason. We'd known before World War II that the Japanese diplomatic corps really didn't want to go to war with the United States. So why did Pearl Harbor happen? Because they weren't calling the shots. The people calling the shots were the military. Hideki Tojo, an army general, was prime minister. He made the decisions. He called the shots. And when he was replaced in 1944 because of some of the failures that he was responsible for, he wasn't replaced with a civilian. He was replaced by an admiral who had previously run the occupation of Korea, which was horrible. Uh, tale in and of itself. So yeah, the diplomats are responding favorably, but the military's not, and the military calls the shot. So from Truman's point of view, that's the bottom line. We have told them they can keep the emperor. We have told them we're not going to do to them what we did to, to Germany. And they see it as a sign of weakness, and they're actually end up being more inclined to keep fighting rather than to surrender. Another thing to keep in mind, and this isn't part of Harry Truman's decision-making, but it's just looking at it realistically, the whole question of dropping the bomb. The United States had pushed the development of atomic weapons from the very beginning of the war, even before the war we were, had started this program. We spent something like $2 billion, which was a lot of money during World War II, to be spending on a weapons program. It was enormously costly. It involved loads of people and all kinds of effort. They built the bomb. They developed atomic weapons with the intention of using them. We were going to use them on Germany. Now, I know the use of a bomb against Japan is portrayed as oh, it's racist. It was only because the people were Asians, they were yellow. And, but the reality is we were building a bomb to drop on white Europeans on the Germans. And if the Germans hadn't surrendered when they did, if they had been able to drag out the war for another six months, we probably would have dropped it on them. So you have to understand, this was a weapon system developed in wartime with the intention that it would be used. You don't spend billions of dollars on a weapon in the middle of a life and death global struggle to develop a weapon that you're not going to use. So we often look at it from a point of view of how, why did Truman decide to drop the bomb? Look at it the other way. Why didn't Truman undecide to drop the bomb? Because basically, when he became president, he inherited the program and the assumption that the bomb would be used. So it's not Harry Truman trying to reach a decision to use it. Harry Truman would have had to reach a decision to not use it to say, well, we spent all this money, we made all this effort for nothing, we're not going to use it, we'll just keep it on the shelf or we'll put it in a warehouse somewhere. That's really the decision that needs to be made here. And that's not a decision he was going to make because they knew the cost of the island hopping campaign. They knew what had happened on Okinawa. Again, 12,000 dead, almost 50,000 casualties. They knew that Kyushu was being reinforced enormously. The, the number of divisions that had come in uh, were going up you know, weekly. They knew it would be horrible. It was so bad that at one point, George Marshall, after the second bomb was dropped on uh, Nagasaki, but before the Japanese surrendered, instead of dropping more on cities, Marshall actually thought about the prospect of using additional bombs to clear beaches and then pass our troops over these nuked beaches to get our troops ashore on Kyushu and maybe save lives that way. That's how bad the situation looked 
to these guys. And that's what's happening with Truman as he's trying to make this decision. Now, let me explain that quote that's in the title. It was the happiest day of my life. I was in graduate school in the 70s. And one of my professors, my senior major professors that I worked with for my PhD, uh, taught American diplomatic history. I, I won't use his name. Uh, he was a very great teacher. Loved him. He was fantastic. But one day we were talking about the use of the atomic bomb. And he was doing the usual, well, you know, we probably shouldn't have dropped it and you know, all this stuff. And I knew that he was a little older than my father. And I knew that my father had been in World War II. And I figured more than likely this guy had been in the Second World War II because all my friends growing up, all their fathers, had been somewhere in a war in Europe or Asia and different arms. Um, so I asked him, Professor, where were you when you heard that they had dropped this huge mega bomb on Hiroshima? And he took a deep breath and he paused and he looked up at the ceiling and he did all those things. And then he looked down and I remember he looked up at me and he said, well, Mike, to be honest, I was on a troop ship on my way from Europe to take part in the invasion of Japan. He said, my unit had fought from you know, Normandy all the way across Europe, Belgium, into Germany. You know, the war had ended there. We thought we were going home, but instead we were getting sent to the Pacific to take part in the invasion of Japan. So I said, so, you're on this troop ship. What did you hear? He said, well, we heard the news that they had dropped this bomb. And the prospect was that, you know, the war would end, which it did a couple of days later. And I said, well, what was your reaction? And he said, well, I hate to say it, but it was the happiest day of my life. He said, I'd been in the military for I think he said like three years. And he said the entirety of those three years, I never knew for sure that I was going to get home alive. I didn't know if I'd make it. But he said, when I heard about the bomb, and I assumed, and everybody seemed to assume that the Japanese would surrender because there were more coming. He said, it was the happiest day of my life. For the first time in three years, I thought, I'm going to make it home alive. And I said to him, I said, well, don't you think maybe that's why you know, Harry Truman dropped the damn thing? And he said, well, yeah, but, you know, my job today is, and then he went off on to his, his other things. But that always stuck with me because I think, you know, decisions are made at the moment. And if you look at all the things going into Harry Truman's decision making, you know, saving the lives of American soldiers, like my professor, like my father, who was out in the Pacific when it was dropped. And his reaction was the same. Thank God I get to go home. I'm going to live. And others who probably had the same thought. And knowing what Truman knows about you know, reinforcements pouring into Kyushu, China, what's going on in China? I mean, this isn't just like a side issue. This was one of the three main things that Truman's requesting information on. What's happening on the ground in China what are the prospects for Chinese civilians in the coming winter if this thing drags on? And as I said, the prospects were that millions would starve to death. They'd already seen several million die in the previous winters because of what the Japanese were doing in China. So there's no reason to believe there won't be several million more who die. And you look at all these things, uh, Truman's making the decision at the moment. And I think it's, it's very clear to me that he made the right decision. He made the right decision to use the atomic weapons. Or you could argue he didn't make the decision not to use them, which is uh, probably more accurate. Because the momentum was there. 
you know, if, if he didn't do anything, they were going to get used. That's basically what it was. Because right up through the time they were dropped, they were still under military control. You know, once they were finished and they were turned over, there was like a shell or a bomb, which is given to the military to use as they see fit. It's not until after the two weapons are dropped on Japan that Truman decides these things need special handling. They need permission from the president to be used. Because they really didn't, in some ways, need presidential permission to be used against Japan. Because the assumption had been they'd be used when they were ready. They were ready, so they were going to be used. Now, does that mean that none of these other things historians talk about, the impact on the Russians or, you know, making America look stronger, that these weren't considerations in Truman's mind? They probably were. But they're not the things, that's why I was talking about the magic summaries, they're not the things he's keeping track of. The things he's keeping track of are, you know, the buildup, the Chinese, the Japanese atomic program, which you rarely hear mentioned. And the diplomatic, you know, impasse with the, the military people telling them to just break off negotiations with the Americans. And I think you look at all that, and then Truman's decision to drop the bomb becomes imminently understandable. At least it's understandable to me. And the best I can do is try to give you my understanding of it and share that with you. And I hope you get something out of this. So if you did get something out of the video, uh, please leave a comment, give it a like, uh, love a subscription, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And until the next time, I'm out of here.